Today, we have our first lecture on operating system security. Everything runs on an operating system, and the operating system is an enormous piece of software that may both provide isolation and authentication between different things running on a system, or be the opposite, a giant ball of low-level C or C++ vulnerable to all sorts of bugs all the way up the stack, from memory safety to just access control. First, a few definitions. Critical to an operating system is this idea of the trusted code base, uh, the components, which are either hardware, software, or even human, whose correct function is sufficient to ensure the security policy of a system is enforced, or alternatively, whose failure can cause a breach of security policy. The trusted code base of an operating system kernel is enormous, and so it's a huge window of attack especially if root slash admin privileges give you access to absolutely everything. And it's not just bugs. Think of who has access to your kernel. Uh, who commits to Linux, for example? Do you trust all of those people? Do you have to trust all of those people? Good systems design, which we'll see, for example, with uh, Android later, uh, and it's SE Linux, will try and split up the trusted code base such that even tasks that uh, run as root don't actually have permission to do absolutely everything. Uh, but this is complicated, limited, and some tasks will still be very powerful, even if you've got good security policy, which not all modern operating systems have. If you want to try and reduce that trusted code base, uh, there's this concept of a reference monitor, uh, which uh, is designed so that maybe the whole operating system isn't trusted, but you've got this one small section that's very carefully vetted that mediates all access control and is small enough for complete analysis. And this is something that modern operating systems like Windows actually use. But it's very difficult to do uh, in a way that really gives you powerful security. Because there are always cracks, it's very difficult to verify even very small systems components. and you will find often that you'll rely on things outside of that implicitly without knowing about it. A related concept in reliability rather than security is this idea of safety integrity levels, where in safety certification, a more dependable system must never rely on a less dependable one, because clearly it's, uh, if it depends on the less reliable system, it's only as dependent as that weakest link in the chain. And we can come up with a similar idea around uh, security integrity levels, where if you have a reference monitor that is reliant on something outside of that reference monitor that's less reliable, that is the weakest link in that chain. Okay, so one of the most important components of an operating system and the way that it isolates between different users of the same system, or even different applications running on the same system, is by access control. And the first thing that we're going to look at is the sorts of traditional access control that you'll see in your own operating systems, discretionary access control, where the user is in control and they want to perhaps uh, limit the damage that other users on the system can do by setting certain files to have limited permissions rather than allowing everything to be edited by everyone. So the way that's implemented in most operating systems is by what we call access control lists. This is where you have an access matrix saying who's allowed to access what, um, and you store it with the file. So rather than storing it with the user, which is capabilities, which we'll look at in a minute, you store that with the file. Each file has a list of principles that are allowed to access it. You may need different permissions for different programs. So just because your uh, camera app should be allowed to view what you're doing in the camera doesn't mean that a calculator app should. So actually, this is really a conceptually a user file program triple. Uh, you want to know what a user running a particular program can access. But often it's not implemented that way, and that can cause all sorts of confusion and limitation in security, as we'll see later. Access control lists makes finding all the files a user has access to a massive pain. So that can make auditing very difficult. And so in reality, you often want something that is more searchable in that way. Uh, 
And so you will combine access control lists in some way with capabilities, which we'll talk about in a minute. In Unix, and thus uh, Linux, Android, iOS, um, the way that permissions primarily work is that rather than having a full access control list of arbitrary complexity, where you literally say who is allowed to access what and store it with the file, each file actually has read, write, execute attributes. So three different uh, attributes, whether the file can be read, written, or executed. And with that, you have three different uh, settings per file. Uh, what the owner can do, what a group attached to it can do, and what the whole world can do. And you can have a richer POSIX extended ACL extension that allows you to do a full access control list of arbitrary complexity, but it's not typically used. We simply, you know, we typically go for this simple policy. So if we look in our screen down here, um, what we have over on the left here are, uh, this file at the bottom is only allowed access by the user and they're only allowed to read and write it. They're not allowed to execute it. They're not allowed to do anything else either. Um, this is the known host file. These are all for SSH. It's the same for these two files, which are private keys. And of course, the user could set the execute if they wanted to as well. It's their file. They own it. More generally, you don't want execute flags being set on things that are innocently downloaded from the internet that you never intended to execute that might have an ability to execute code that you didn't want to. In this example, with the uh, with these keys inside the .ssh, um, the public key is world readable because it's safe for that to be world readable. Uh, and actually, although these are all discretionary, SSH typically won't work unless your private key is set to only be readable and writable by the user and not the group. In this picture, the group is all set to Sam, so they're both owned by me as the user and the group. The group could be something else, like uh, all people in the uh, accounting department or something. And indeed, users can be part of multiple different groups. So you can have someone who's part of the accounting group, who's part of the uh, system security group, who's part of the administrators group, and you can be attached to multiple of those. And actually, on my machine, if we type group Sam to find all the groups that I'm in, we've got these here. So I'm part of the group Sam, which Sam is the only member uh, by default. Uh, we've got a CD-ROM because I'm allowed to use the CD. We've got sudo because I'm allowed admin privileges. And then the rest of these are broadly just capabilities for things like uh, uh, file sharing and printers. And so they're not groups of users in the traditional sense of files that people would be able to access. They're effectively uh, groups of permissions that are attached via a group in an easy to manage way. And we'll see more of that later in Android. Likewise, if we type uh, cat uh, slash ect slash group, we get all of the groups on the system and all of the members of them. And uh, there are again various groups here most of them broadly based around permissions of uh, things that you can do on the system, like access the uh, floppy disk drive, which is uh, quite an antiquated one, which is why nobody's in that group. But you can use it for file permissions as well in the more literal sense. And uh, often Unix based systems treat almost everything as being a file so that you can use this uh, quite clean, simple access control system with them. I said earlier that uh, permissions were normally this user program file triple, and you want to have different permissions when you're running your calculator versus when you're running your camera versus when you're running your SSH client. And the way that Unix deals with that, Unix-based operating systems, are that you have just the user file triple, which is what we had implemented over here, but executable files can also have a set UID and set GID bits that when you run that program, changes the user ID or the group ID to a different group ID, one set by the file rather than by the user. And we'll see how you can use that to isolate applications from each other so that uh, your calculator can't access your SSH keys, for example, later. But the idea is that you get this uh, indirect form of this triple that's implemented in a very complicated way. 
And what it leads towards is things like a SUID route on all applications. If you're writing an application and you want an easy life or you just want it to work, uh, the logically correct thing to do is to set uh, your, the user ID when running that program to root. Then all of your permissions problems will go away. It'll just work, right? But also it will be wildly insecure because a bug in your program is now a bug in the entire system. And anyone who can exploit your program can exploit everything on that system. You'll want to avoid that sort of accidental privilege escalation in the name of uh, improved development time. Now, I've mentioned capabilities a few times already, but the idea of a capability is, uh, as an analog to an access control list, is that this stores the access matrix with the user rather than with the file. So, an example of a capability is actually in this picture I showed you earlier. It's the public and private key pairs that we have here. The access to the private key is a capability that proves that you are me. If users can share capabilities around because they're stored with the user, then if a capability gets leaked, all you can do is revoke it completely. You can't revoke it for individual users necessarily. Finding all of the users who have access to a file is very difficult because you have to search in the users themselves what capabilities they have rather than searching within the file. So it's the analog of the uh, uh, access control list. But they're very scalable. Uh, you send someone out a capability, which often will be a uh, cryptographic key, but not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. And we'll saw one last time with the Cherry capability architecture, where there's no cryptography involved at all. It's hardware enforced. And real systems, because they want to have for all of these properties, they want to be able to revoke access very easily. They want to be scalable. Uh, what you actually end up doing is some mix of access controllers and capabilities. Often you will have a server that uh, stores an access control list and then issues limited time capabilities that only work for a short amount of time. And you accept that you can't revoke these on a short term, but over the long term you recycle them and issue new keys periodically. And that's not the only form of access control in town. It's not only a discretionary access control that uh, might be useful for your system. You also increasingly have mandatory access control. Now, what's the difference between these two then? Uh, in discretionary access control, as an owner of a system, you start in supervisor mode with ultimate power. And as an admin, you can make less privileged accounts available for less trusted tasks. Maybe even if it's just you running something, you might run something with a less privileged task mode because you don't trust the applications that you're running. Or it could be that you don't trust the users of your system to access everything of every other user. Um, and so you put in place uh, restrictions that can be uh, restricted down further to a principle of less privilege when you deem it necessary. So it's discretionary. Mandatory access control in that sort of scenario, the sysadmin, the administrator of the server, is no longer the boss. Uh, the ultimate control rests with the security policy, uh, which is the policy set for the device by potentially someone remote, a remote government authority in a defense setting. If you look at this from the Android point of view, the alternative perspective on that is that discretionary access control requires just the permission of the user. They can make their things uh, more permissive or less permissive as they feel like. Mandatory access control requires consent of the user, developer, and platform. There's three-way consent, and the user alone, even with admin privileges, isn't allowed to do arbitrary things with access control, and neither is the developer. So mandatory access control started out as primarily a military thing. Uh, it's occasionally synonymous with a MLS, or multi-level security, where the idea is that you have a unclassified documents, confidential documents, secret documents, and top secret documents, where there's uh, increasingly high levels of secrecy, and you don't want things to leak from the more secret levels to the less secret levels. Um, an example of this is Bell Lepadula, and users even at top secret aren't allowed to get around it. Uh, so the Bell Lepadula rules are the simple rule, no read up, a subject at a given security level may not read an object of a higher security level. 
that one is the simple one, hence the name, in that uh, if you are unclassified, you shouldn't be able to read top secret documents. The star property is the weird one, the no write down. A subject at a given security level may not write to any object at a lower security level. So the top secret can't write down to unclassified and leak documents to unclassified, even if they wanted to. This isn't discretionary, it's mandatory. And the reason for that is not only to stop people leaking stuff directly, it's to stop things like resident malware from being able to leak downwards from top secret to unclassified, even if there is malware that's existing at top secret. Of course, it's very difficult to do that in reality uh, because of all of the covert channels that we talked about in the hardware security lectures. And there's an opposite concept called Bieber, which uses uh, the opposite duality of confidentiality, which is what uh, Bella Pantelier is dealing with, and integrity, which is what Bieber is dealing with, to reverse BLP. And here you have a low watermark. The integrity of an object is the lowest level of all of the objects that contributed to its creation. So what you have here is, think about this in terms of, say, execution of code, which is where it makes most sense. Uh, there's a simple rule, uh, no write-up, a subject at a given security level may not write to an object at a higher security level. So say if you're just a uh, lowly uh, system user, you shouldn't be able to write to the kernel of an operating system because then you'd change what the kernel did. Clearly that's bad and wrong, so it shouldn't ever be allowed. Um, but there's also no read down. A subject at a given security level may not read from any object at a lower security level. So you shouldn't be able to, say, execute code that's come from the internet if you're in kernel mode. Um, again, because you will become unduly influenced by that outside world. And this is actually used in Windows to a partial extent. Uh, we'll see to what extent this is really used in Windows later on. So. The military mostly gave up on Bell the Padular systems because they were riddled with covert channels. Even if you can't directly communicate from the top secret level down to unclassified, you might be able to do so by contending the disk drive or changing the state of the cache or messing around with timers. And it's very difficult to get below a uh, few bytes per second uh, covert channel in practice that can be of a limited use. If you're trying to leak a key and you can leak that at a few bytes per second, that's really easy. Granted, if you're trying to leak something more complicated like a full video set, then uh, that will be more difficult over a covert channel, so that would be more safe. But what happens in real military systems these days is that you tend to use what we call system high. Every single system is at just one level and there's no communication between them directly. There's uh, air gaps implemented by firewall. Uh, so you're only ever connected, even if you use the same system to connect to them, you're only ever connected to one of them at a time. Uh, this is the idea of multiple independent levels of security. And depending how far you want to go along that and your exact threat model of how much you want to protect, they might literally be real systems with complete air gaps or some of this might be allowed to be virtualized. On Linux and Windows, you mostly have discretionary access control. But there are some ideas inspired by managed access control, especially in SE Linux, which is used in Android, which we'll look at later. And there are other things that you would consider to be mandatory access control that don't quite work directly like an access control mechanism like a Bell or Padula. Um, bring your own device management is one such example, and Samsung Knox is a particular example of that, where in Samsung Knox, uh, running on smartphones, uh, there's this idea of these separate uh, low and high parts of the phone. You do all of your business stuff in the high section, uh, and this is all implemented via ARM Trust Zone, uh, whereas you can run in the low section, you can have all of your other apps and things that uh, just allows a person to do what they want with their phone while not having two separate phones, one for business and one for personal use. There's also things like uh, when you install Office 365 on a smartphone, it will change the permissions of a device and refuse to install unless you've got things like password protection. So there are forms here of four-party consent where it's not just the user developer on the platform, it's also the company that the user works for. 
uh, on the less salubrious end of these sorts of tools, there are uh, bring your own device manager softwares, which uh, look very similar to remote access uh, Trojans. So allow businesses to spy on their users. Digital rights management is also a form of mandatory access control. Uh, what you're trying to do there is stopping a subscriber at top secret sharing with a non-subscriber unclassified. And actually, uh, there have been attempts at using things like uh, enclaves and trusted execution to vet these things on remote devices, uh, though most of them have failed because uh, everyone saw it as a lock-in play designed to uh, give power to uh, Intel and Microsoft rather than to the uh, creators of the content. There's also trusted boot, where the idea is that the original equipment manufacturer should set what the bootloader and kernel should be and there should be a vetted sequence that is only allowed when that runs and the idea is that that is to stop persistent malware though it also locks down exactly what runs on the system and we'll talk more about trusted boot next time so now we're on to our first case study which is android which i've talked about a little bit already it's a Linux derivative, it's based on the Linux kernel, and so ultimately it bases its security on the same access control list, this same idea of read, write, execute, and user group world that we've seen before. But what you actually do to isolate apps from each other, which is unlike what you would see on a standard Linux, or indeed a certainly on standard Windows, is that you treat apps by different companies as different users. So they're all being run by you, the one user of the phone, but they all have different set UIDs that are set to the company's user. So that isolates them all from each other. Uh, if you have an app that's by the same company, you're allowed to use the same user ID and so they can see each other's files. But if it's a different company, different user ID, and so they get their own little bit of file storage and so they are stopped from seeing each other unless they try really hard and write into the general file system area. You implement that using setUID, the standard Linux uh, mechanism for implementing uh, effectively different permissions for different programs. And so that gives you the third element of the triple very directly. And in fact, that takes more precedence in Android because uh, Android phones typically don't have multiple literal users in the human sense. Permissions are effectively capabilities implemented by adding uh, group IDs to the list of groups of the user ID set by uh, set UID. So that means that uh, if I'm running my uh, flashlight app, it will have set UID set for uh, the flashlight developer company. And what that uh, will have is that there will be a capability permission added to it by adding a group ID to the list of groups of the flashlight user ID that allowed to use the uh, torch permission to it, for example. Uh, but we won't give it the camera permission, even if it asks because, uh, and we certainly won't give it access to the phone book when it asks, so we won't allow it to sell that on for a little bit of money there's this idea of permissions manifests which come with the app and are set by the developer and they basically compile down to this setup of uh, user IDs and GIDs. On early versions of Android, uh, all of the permissions were granted in install time and so that meant that all of the group IDs were added to the user ID at install and so you've got this big list of permissions which you ticked yes to. I want to install this app now, I don't want to read this. Uh, so flashlight apps, like I said, started demanding your uh, address book at install time so they could sell it. And so these days, since Android 6, uh, Google moved to the same model of Apple, which is trust on first use, uh, where you don't just ask it to install time. When the app first tries to use the camera or first tries to access the address book, uh, book you can either click allow or deny, which gives the user a little bit more time to think about whether they really want to give it this permission, uh, whether there's any need for it to have the address book, and if it requests it and then refuses to work, once that, maybe they should uninstall it and try a different flashlight app. But earlier apps than that, early apps uh, made before Android 6, still demand installation 
uh, still demand permissions on installation, it's very difficult to change your ecosystem and make it more secure once you've deployed it because things will break and people will complain. A more recent addition to the Android security canon is this idea of security enhanced Linux uh, and this idea of th three party consent where it's not just the user, it's the user developer and platform that sets what happens. But the idea is that you protect the core system functions even from some parts of the kernel. So just because something is running as root doesn't mean it can access absolutely everything. You're trying to limit the bugs in the kernel from uh, being able to have absolute control, even though it's uh, often impossible to do that completely. And you're certainly trying to prevent a badly written app from doing something that it didn't intend to. And this increases the isolation by making these things more mandatory. So to show how that works, let's look at a bug from the Google paper on how SE Linux was used in Android. Um, this was called a ginger break, which was a root mechanism to allow you to have root access to your phone and uh, therefore control it in ways that you like rather than having the uh, vendor control what happens on the phone. But also very quickly in malware, which is a ginger master, which used it to attack the phone rather than the user trying to break in for their own purposes. Um, so there was a bug in Vold, which is the external storage manager in Android. There was a bug in the kernel. And since Vault runs as root, because uh, it needs to, to be able to mount that, uh, this meant that uh, the bug in it allowed you to run a root shell, i.e. A, a command line shell script uh, interpreter that allowed you to do anything that you like, include rooting the whole device. If SE links were available in Gingerbread, which is what this attacked, which was Android 2.3, then SE links could have block this in several places despite Vault being set as root. Uh, so an app, a general app could be blocked from reading the process ID of Vault because uh, apps shouldn't be allowed to read process IDs in general. There's uh, no need for that so it should be blocked by the mandatory policy. Uh, apps could be blocked from sending messages to Vault so you wouldn't be able to do a request, an arbitrary request that uh, exploited this bug in Vault. Vault could be blocked from executing non-system binaries. There should only be certain binaries that Vault should be allowed to execute. And you can express that with an arbitrary complicated security policy. Even if you manage to get past all of those, your root shell will still only have the same security ID privileges as Vault itself. Even though the uh, user ID is set to root, this idea of a security ID, which comes with security enhanced Linux, will not be changed. So the security from the mandatory access control policy will remain the same and prevent uh, arbitrary access to the whole device. And that's an example of how it would help in kernel land to have this sort of more complicated uh, security policy. But it also helps in user land in that um, the bug here is in Skype, which is quite a famous company, and yet it had a bug in the way that it specified its access control, in that the access control was set to world readable for Skype's app. And so that meant that uh, there was data in there that uh, allowed uh, user IDs, contacts, phone numbers, date of birth, uh, instant messages, logs, and other private information that was readable by any terrible app that was installed by anyone uh, using your uh, phone. Now, you don't want uh, all of the apps that you install on your phone, many of which you don't completely trust, uh, many of which may be at least partly malicious, uh, even if they're apps that you intended to install, you don't necessarily want to give them access to all this uh, via the back door if you've refused permission at the front door. So, SE Linux uh, enforces so that an app can't give away permissions to things inside its own directory. If an app wants to share data with an app of a different user ID set, so from a different company, it has to try really hard and store it in the general file system with general file system permissions. And Android is increasingly trying to discourage use of wide permissions like that uh, and instead move things if they want to do file sharing to APIs that say only allow access to images. Security Enhanced Linux has been in Linux since uh, Linux Kernel 2.6 and it's now heavily used in Android in the way that we've talked about. And what this does is it builds a role-based access control on top of something called type enforcement. 
And the way that works is that uh, users are mapped to roles at login. So a user can be mapped to accountant role or something, or a secretary or pseudoers. Um, roles are then authorized by domains and domains give out permissions based on types. And this is quite a general constraint system. It's far more elaborate and complicated than the Linux access control, discretionary access control system, though beware in security in general, uh, uh, complexity can often mean that the defaults are wrong and that it's very easy to end up with something that's accidentally very insecure. And this can handle integrity as well as confidentiality. Uh, it allows roles to be revised when programs are invoked, so you can lose your system writing privilege when running internet downloaded software. Uh, and it's basically a general constraints en engine that can express role-based access control, type enforcement, and multi-level security. Uh, so you can do things like separate your DNS server from your web server via this mandatory access control mechanism. Now, that all sounds kind of amazing, and it is uh, the case that you can run things like have a banking app on your phone in at the same time as some terrible free-to-play scam app and expect the banking app to be isolated from that scam app. And that's uh, in many ways quite uh, alarming that that's at all possible. But there are issues. Uh, this is uh, it's less clean than it looks, even though the theory is very nice and the implementation allows quite a complex access control. Uh, the API for permissions has really quite poor documentation. Uh, the permission system is often the enemy of the developer who ends up requesting more permission than they really need just because it's the easiest way to work. Uh, if you're wanting to write a permissions manifest for Android, a lot of it is about copying from Stack Overflow because uh, it's too complicated to do anything otherwise. And there's very limited scope for failed safe defaults that just do the right thing. Android still has malware. It's not the case that Android is totally secure, obviously. Um, you can buy zero days from companies like Pegasus, but it costs you a million dollars for one that attacks the latest devices and requires no clicks, uh, which is too expensive to attack users that aren't interesting. But of course, there are lots of unpatched devices uh, that are far easier to attack with things that aren't zero days, no well-known exploits, which are much easier to do. Um, you don't risk leaking the exploit if it's just something that's publicly known but not patched. Uh, there are lots of devices out there that can't be patched even if they want to be because the OS operate, uh, update ecosystem is in control of the device manufacturer, not Google themselves, though Google are trying to fix that. There are also alternative markets on Google Play. Now, Google can still use mandatory access control for any application running on Android, but it can't potentially scan the code in the same way as it does when code is running on the Play Store. And it can't uh, deny list apps in the same way as it does when they're on the Play Store. So the consent of the platform by allowing alternative uh, stores uh, diminishes the consent of the platform. It diminishes what Google is able to control. This is all, there's also the issue that all of this is normally just a software thing that's implemented in software and has no real backing in the real world. It's not like it's fundamentally based on encryption or anything. And so the getting access control right intersects with a lot of awkward edge cases. Uh, something like factory reset, you expect a factory reset to completely delete and uh, irrevocably remove uh, all of your secrets. Um, but actually, with a complex hardware software stack, uh, with wear leveling on your solid state drive in the phone, uh, it can often be very easy, or it certainly was in the past, to recover the Google master cookie and access Gmail account even after a device has been factory reset, because uh, there's not a lot of incentive to get those factory reset mechanisms uh, working correctly by each of the vendors. And so often things go wrong. Now, many files will be encrypted if you want them to be on Android, but uh, often the default is no encryption, unlike on iOS, where the default is encryption on every file. And that brings us to iOS, which is a actually very similar operating system at its core. It's also a Unix derivative, uh, like uh, Android, which is by Linux, but rather than being a 
Linux operating system derivative, uh, iOS came via a route of FreeBSD and then the Mac kernel, which in turn was based on FreeBSD. Uh, all of Apple's operating systems, uh, OS X and iOS and iPad OS, are based on that same lineage, but they're all fundamentally Unix derivatives. Um, so they also use uh, domain and type enforcement like uh, SE Linux, uh, that sort of style of managed access control for tamper-proof system components. And uh, app permissions, like in the Android ecosystem, are capabilities that are granted on first use by the consent of the user. Apps that are in the Apple Store are signed, uh, and in this case, it's signed by the by Apple themselves. Uh, on Android, at least in the Google Play Store, all of the apps there are signed, but they're signed by the developer. So you've got integrity of the file that the developer really did issue this file, or at least someone who has their key did. Now, much like with Google Play, uh, the Apple Store allows screening of all of the apps. You can screen all of the uh, at least all of the bit code and all of the binaries in there if you are Apple and you can check all of the permissions and you can also take 30% of the revenue just like in Google Play. The only difference is that on iOS uh, the Apple Store is the only way of having applications whereas on Android uh, though it's discouraged by Google and they try to stop you from doing it uh, you can add alternate stores like the Amazon Store or anyone else's store and often the manufacturers will add their own stores in and do their own drive for downloads on Android. Uh, whereas the value for Apple is that they control their entire vertical ecosystem. There are no manufacturers of their devices but Apple, so they control the lot. And so there aren't those misaligned incentives. Though Apple control nominally their entire ecosystem, they design their hardware and they uh, design their software and they design all of their devices. Uh, there are still supply chain issues. They still have their devices manufactured by someone. They still use lots of software that is at least based on open source in that it's uh, via the FreeBSD uh, and then via Mac and uses lots of uh, open source libraries too and uses uh, ARM ISAs, even though they now design their own microarchitecture. Much like everyone else, their code bases are enormous. The trusted code base is enormous. So, if you've got biometrics, which you use to open your phone, those are stored by encryption within uh, Apple's own secure enclave that's on chip. Uh, neither iOS, the great big blob of software, the enormous operating system, nor ARM's trust zone, which uh, runs is an enclave that uh, runs in the processor itself, uh, much like SGX, which we talked about last time, uh, neither of those are trusted with the data because the code base is just far too big to be vetted of both the hardware and the software. And so you want to limit the access to the biometrics, primarily because biometrics can't be revoked. Once they get leaked, they're leaked forever. You can't change your fingerprint just because it's been leaked on the internet. And iOS does have encryption by default. And the way that that works is that uh, you put in your passcode on the phone or your biometrics and you try it 10 tries. Uh, if you go past that, uh, the file keys are deleted permanently. Otherwise, they're derived by the trusted enclave and then you can access all of your files because you've got the key to decrypt them. Otherwise, they're deleted and your files are gone forever because the idea is that uh, uh, loss of your secrecy and loss of your privacy is a more important threat model in this environment of the phone than loss of the data on the phone. The key management of that enclave is uh, bootstrapped by a unique 256-bit AES key uh, burnt into fusible links on the system on chip. So there's real hardware there uh, that's unique in every device. And um, we'll talk more about the vertical integration and how it makes uh, iOS fundamentally different from Android, uh, despite very, very similar building blocks and a quite similar cost for a zero-day vulnerability in ecosystems. Now then, we're on to Windows, which used to be the most popular operating system in the world, but now it's probably in third place, certainly behind Android and probably behind iOS as well. Um, but it's so important because it's so heavily used in the business world. In Windows, your access control lists are literally access control lists. Um, before Windows NT, which is what came before Windows 2000, then you got XP, then you got Vista, and then you got 
seven, then you got eight, then you've got ten, now you've got eleven. Um, from Windows NT onwards, uh, you get this comp very complex access control, but it is literally at least an access control list, so that's simple, right? Uh, before then, in Windows 98, there was effectively no security whatsoever. Uh, there wasn't even a distinction between a standard user and a root user. You could do anything you liked. In this permission system, you not only have read, write, and execute, but you also have a, a take ownership, change permissions, and delete. So that gives you a lot of configurability, but it also gives you a lot of complexity that means things can be set to very wrongly if you're not careful. The administration of users can be grouped so that there are different administrators for different users on the same system rather than having a distinct route for all of them because this is an operating system that is uh, primarily for uh, big customers with lots of distinct users. The data structure that stores all of these permissions is called the registry, which is basically a big database. And there's a security account manager within that that handles passwords and stores them in a hashed encrypted format. If you're dealing with remote users, which you often are in a Windows ecosystem, then there's something called Active Directory. That's a service that's used to manage remote authentication via protocols uh, Kerberos or TLS, the protocol used for HTTPS for key exchange. So what we have here is an example of the permissions that you will see on a typical file in Windows. And in this case, it's a, a security engineering networks file. And so we've got here uh, authenticated users, which is anyone who's logged in, uh, system, uh, administrators and users. And you would, those are all groups. Uh, so you have a form of role-based access control. But you will also have uh, individual users uh, in here as well for most files. So like uh, uh, I might have an individual uh, entry in here for Sam that allows me to have some of these permissions and then deny them for everyone else. And we've got both allow and deny where deny takes precedence over allow. You also have this one called system audit, which allows things like logging that the action has occurred whenever it's happened. Um, and you also have things like over in this corner over here, you have a append data. So that's one that Linux doesn't have. And actually, that's one way it's kind of a pain that it doesn't have that. There are lots of systems where you don't want someone to be able to overwrite a file, uh, but you do still want them to be able to add things to it. So append only. And the way that you would implement that without this permission natively in the operating system is that you probably have uh, either an application with a set UID bit that uh, was meant to vet it. So having the application in this, uh, having the security in the application layer, or you'd have a remote system that uh, implemented it uh, via having a API that only allowed append only but you wouldn't have any guarantees from the operating system itself. Whereas Windows, in all of its infinite complexity, really does allow that. But what Windows does not have is this idea of a user program file as a triple, or even set UID. So this idea in Android of having different applications not be able to have all of the same permissions, so your flashlight app can't steal your address book, isn't encoded in Windows at all. You don't even have set UID as a limited form to allow that. Uh, the access control is just as user and file. Uh, now you have a separate system for permissions that's entirely devoid of that permissions system, uh, devoid of that access control list, but that only works for apps, uh, which are a special category of application which come from the Windows Store and run inside jails, so they aren't allowed access to the entire operating system. They, they can't do certain syscalls. Um, but most applications on Windows, most programs, are not apps from the Windows Store. They're just general pieces of uh, x86 binaries that run on the system. Because this idea of an app in the Windows Store sense is a relatively recent one. And if you're Windows, the key thing is backwards compatibility. So you can't mandate that uh, all of the applications that run on Windows from tomorrow come from the Windows Store. It just wouldn't fly. And so you have to put up with the insecurity of the existing access control list around uh, permissions within the same human user. And so you can't, for example, isolate away your SSH keys. Now, Windows is a very old and historied operating system. Some of the features that we got in Windows Vista in 2007 
were that uh, most of the drivers were removed from the kernel. So if you have a driver now, it mostly runs in user mode, which was a big source of vulnerability before that happened because drivers were mostly very badly written. They're third party written things that were running with a, a root level privilege. This is obviously a bad thing. It's a big source of bugs as well as security issues. Um, there was this idea of a, a UAC or user account control where rather than if you're a user with admin privilege, you run as admin all of the time. Uh, instead, you have a user mode default that you then escalate to when the user requests it, um, which is also used on uh, Mac OS X, um, a similar property of uh, user elevation. Um, in Windows XP, many routine tasks needed admin privilege. Uh, everything basically ran as admin therefore and you gave everyone an admin privilege just to avoid hurting their feelings and so almost every bit of software ran as admin and so if you didn't trust the bit of software that you ran uh, then you'd end up doing weird things like logging out logging into a different version of your user that had uh, only user mode privileges and this was just daft it wasn't at all robust uh, it involved the user doing weird things to get any sort of security and it meant that most of the time programs ran with far more privilege than they needed. This idea of uh, elevation prompts for admin privilege, uh, user account control, uh, is this idea of removing ambient authority where you have permissions all of the time. Uh, access should be uh, temporary. It's a uh, pseudo rather than root uh, in Linux terms. Uh, you don't run as root all of the time and run any little app as root so that it can access everything. You keep things uh, secure until they need the privilege. But this is a real complicated issue when you've got an ecosystem, when you've got 20 years of software or more that all assume this ambient authority. And so UAC was a massive pain when it was first deployed in Windows Vista. Uh, and the natural thing when something is a pain and issues lots of false alarms is to turn it off. And so luckily that's died down over the years as software has been written better. But there are also features in Windows Vista onwards to try and virtualize away some of these crafty old apps. So something like the application information service, which uh, launches apps that require elevated privilege because they were written a million years ago and virtualizes them. So they get an imaginary version of the registry, the database that controls everything in Windows to alter, that stays with them. Their modifications only appear to them and get reset when they turn off and then reappear as if by magic when that application opens up again. It's a form of jailing to stop this insecurity of old applications from killing the security of the entire operating system. In Windows 8, there was this idea of dynamic access control to give contextual control so that you have different permissions and allow, allowed to do different things and allow different things to happen uh, in a work environment versus a home environment versus the phone even though uh, you log in using the same mechanism. Uh, those are all set in Active Directory, uh, which uses Kerberos for authentication, i.e. this is around having your logins be stored remotely and access the same device, which was a big push in Windows 8. You now authenticate with a remote server. And the way that works is that uh, you're encouraged to sign in these days with a Microsoft account authenticated remotely. Uh, and where credentials are stored locally, they're protected using virtualization to stop everything from being able to read those credentials. Every time a user logs in, there's this thing called a security identifier that gets generated by the remote server, which is a form of capability. And that's how they're authenticated temporarily until they access that server again and get a new security identifier. There's also this idea of secure boot uh, using a trusted platform module or TPM to verify the boot sequence to get rid of persistent malware that stays every time you boot. So you try and vet that the, the bootloader, the BIOS, uh, the operating system are all set the configuration that you intended. Uh, they're all verified and they're matched to what the OEM expects. And there's also a usability feature in form of a pin login. So if you are logging into a Windows machine these days, rather than typing in your password every time, you might just type in a four letter pin, which uh, surely is far less secure, right? Uh, 
Uh, but the idea is that you're only allowed to use this pin to log in on devices that you've logged in on before, whereas your uh, password to your Microsoft account can log you in everywhere. And by having the pin as a usability feature, which is short, the hope is that you can have a password that is sufficiently longer and therefore sufficiently more secure this, uh, without it being a usability nightmare. Now, we're getting through the many different versions of Windows now, so we're right up to Windows 10, where uh, one of the security usability features, again, is this idea of control at delete disappeared. So on older versions of Windows, every time you logged in, uh, you were meant to type control at delete, and it was meant to make you super secure. And the reason it's gone is that nobody understood how it worked, so it didn't really provide any security. What it was meant to be doing was providing a unique uh, key sequence that only the operating system could respond to. So when you typed in control alt delete then you knew that it was the operating system that was giving you the prompt to type in your password. Uh, but that's far too complicated for most users to get their head around. So why would you pay attention if something different happened or if some fake login prompt didn't tell you to type in control alt delete instead? It allows multi-factor authentication support. So as well as your password or PIN you might also uh, prove that uh, it's really you and you really long to want to log in by having a USB device uh, called a Fido that stores key material and generates attestation to prove that it's really you. Uh, and this is something that uh, Google now gives to all of its employees. The other thing that you got was called uh, device encryption, aka BitLocker device encryption which is not the same thing as another thing in Windows called BitLocker, that's different. Now they're both for file encryption. Uh, the way that BitLocker device encryption, aka device encryption works, is that files are encrypted on your hard disk and if you forget the key, you can recover it via your Microsoft account because there is a recovery key stored on Microsoft servers. But otherwise, the uh, key is stored on the TPM or Trusted Platform module so that you can't get attacked by core boot attacks because it's not stored anywhere on the hard disk. It's only inside the tamper-proof enclave and you access it by typing in the correct password in the boot sequence, at which point your files get decrypted because you get access to the key. BitLocker is a slightly different thing and a slightly older thing which is also around encryption but rather than storing it in Microsoft servers, uh, BitLocker allows you to use either a USB startup key if there's no TPM or a password uh, or just the TPM uh, to encrypt and decrypt the files on your system uh, without being backed by Microsoft. Uh, but uh, BitLocker rather than BitLocker device encryption uh, costs you more money because you only get it with Windows Pro. And uh, perhaps part of the reason for that is that Microsoft doesn't trust you to not lose your uh, key. So it wants you, if you're using this on a home operating system, to uh, have that resilience in the cloud. Now, I mentioned this idea of mandatory integrity control in Windows earlier. And what this does is it adds an integrity level to every file in your operating system, either low, medium, high or system. And if you're a standard user, then uh, all of your files get set to medium. If you're an elevated user, files get set to high. And if a user gone up to admin privilege. And if you're a browser, then you files that you download get set to low. And the idea is that when a file is executed, uh, the object starts with a minimum integrity level of the user and the file. So this is like Bieber, right? It's this no write-up policy where you're not allowed to affect the integrity of things at high uh, by influencing them unduly from things at low. But while there's a no write-up, there's a simple rule, there's no no read down, there's no star property that stops the operating system from reading anything that it likes. Things downloaded in Internet Explorer can read most files but not write to them to limit malware damage. Uh, it's not really mandatory. You can have user confirmation instead to upgrade uh, downloaded content. So though it's a multi-level security, it's not a mandatory access control thing. Even though it's called mandatory integrity control, uh, you can get around it. Contrast this with the Android ecosystem, which really does isolate each app to its own mandatory domain. Uh, Windows instead goes for this you can read anything property. 
And the reason for that, the reason that admin is allowed to read anything and therefore be unduly influenced by a bad actor, potentially, is that the Windows ecosystem security is all based around antivirus software, and it always has been. And if you have antivirus software, you want it to be able to see everything. Uh, whereas that fundamentally conflicts with this idea of isolation of apps in Android, where in Android, you accept that uh, many of the applications that you're running might be at least partly malicious and don't allow them to see the other apps uh, as a result, uh, which is uh, totally anathema to the Windows ecosystem, which is why they're using mandatory access controls in very, very different ways, despite being nominally uh, operating systems used by consumers, right? Well, so why is Windows so complicated? Uh, why is it that uh, often a lot of these access controls are irrelevant to people? If you leave your laptop on a train, then you're screwed because it's probably not encrypted. We've talked about BitLocker device encryption, which is available on Windows Home, but it's often disabled by the OEM or original man equipment manufacturer of devices. So you can't turn it on even if you'd want to. BitLocker, the one where you don't store your keys in Microsoft servers, uh, costs you over a hundred quid extra because you have to stump up for the pro version of the operating system. So the access control just won't help you. There's no encryption behind it. So anyone with physical access can steal the files anyway off of your machine. So this whole access control system makes sense if you've got a file server in a concrete box that miles, that miles away, you don't want someone to craftily access files remotely on. But it doesn't really make sense if there's physical access, then you need encryption. And the reason that Microsoft allow this and think this is an okay ecosystem to be running is because most of their customers are big corporate actors. Microsoft makes half of its revenue from firms of uh, 25,000 seats or more. So it's big companies that need really complicated access controls. And that's why you have this mind-boggling array of very configurable settings. It allows you to implement almost all of what you want in the operating system rather than hacking it into a web server or into an application that voluntarily gives away privileges. Um, but it doesn't support many of the things that you'd want as a user, like isolation between applications on the device, except in very limited circumstances. So setting up access control for a big Windows shop is a very highly skilled job and it's very easy to get it wrong. If you're a small actor, you'll lose out by it being a bit too difficult to set the right settings to make your system secure. And the other big problem, the other reason that Windows is so complicated, is that it's got decades of backwards compatibility. Every time you issue a Windows update, you've got to test at scale because you've got all of these applications that have been uh, developed over decades that many people will still be using, where the source code may even be completely long lost, so they can't be edited to uh, correctly react to new security features anyway and they might have all sorts of strange features that they use implicitly that were never uh, intended functionality of the operating system yet should still work and because of this you have to introduce new features slowly test them an awful lot uh, by having sort of big racks of servers running every important bit of software uh, you have to nudge people to to take up these security features otherwise you get nightmares like uh, UAC in Vista where it's just boxes upon boxes upon boxes popping up of requesting the user to do the most menial things that don't matter because all of the software had assumed uh, ambient privilege all of the time and complex compatibility layers like the application information service to virtualize the entire registry to trick applications into thinking that they have ultimate control Okay, so that's the story of operating systems at the user level. Next time, we'll still be talking about operating system security, but we'll be looking more at virtualization, where it's more about isolation than access control. Um, for further reading on this part, uh, lecture, uh, chapters uh, six and nine on discretionary and mandatory access control will be of interest. Chapter 22 on phones will be of interest, especially for the Android and iOS ecosystems. And chapter 27 on secure systems development. Uh, then we've got uh, Google's uh, Secure and Reliable Systems book, uh, particularly it's chapter 5 on design for least privilege, where it's not operating systems that it's talking about specifically, but nevertheless, this idea of developing apps with uh, 
the least privilege that they need uh, is very important when you're designing an operating system. Uh, then we've got Google's paper here on adding mandatory access controls to Android via SE Linux. And then finally, here and here, we've got descriptions from Microsoft documentation on the differences between BitLocker and the totally different BitLocker device encryption. See you next time.